I bring you the trial of Brutus and some of the assassins of Julius Caesar. Thank you very much. Good evening, members of the jury. Uh, you are here to try these defendants for, for the crime of murder, uh, or so it is alleged. Uh, at the outset of a trial of a trial by jury, it's usually helpful to establish one or two of the ground rules uh, of the conventional ones uh, which apply. Only some apply to the present trial. <laughs> First, which does apply, uh, is this. The decision will be yours and yours alone. It's not mine, and you mustn't look for any kind of a lead from me. Uh, secondly, normally, I should be asking you to make sure that you try the case only on the evidence that you hear in court. There isn't, as I understand it, going to be any evidence. <laughs> it may be that there's a certain shortage of witnesses. Uh, but what you are going to hear are presentations of the case, both for and against these accused. And you'll try the case, please, uh, on that uh, and that alone. Conventionally, I should be able to reassure you uh, that at the end of the trial, uh, I should be directing you as to the law that you should apply. That isn't going to happen either. Uh, you might have been asked to apply the law of England and Wales as at 2016. You might have been asked to apply the law of the Roman Republic as at 44 BC. In fact, as I understand it, you are left an entirely free hand <laughs> about the law that you apply. Uh, you may well find uh, that the submissions are quite largely directed to that issue. And you may find, but of course I don't know, uh, that the issue in the case is not so much what happened, but the circumstances, if any, in which a killing of this kind can properly be justified in law. But you are asked to make a decision on uh, an understanding, uh, or each of you, of a general proposition of law. In other words, you're not simply asked to decide whether you like the look of the defendants or are rather attracted to the uh, character of the deceased. Neither of those will do. The conventional warning to members of the jury to avoid re re recourse to what you have read in the newspapers about the case <laughs> or what you may find on the internet about the case applies to the present proceedings as much as to any other. Please put out of your mind what you may have read from the bloggers uh, or elsewhere on the internet or for that matter in the works of worthy Elizabethan playwrights. <laughs> we ask you to decide on the basis of the submissions that are made to you. The Crown, the, I'm sorry, the prosecution will have to satisfy you as to the guilt of the defendants. I don't anticipate that you'll be asked to distinguish between them. It's either yes or no, guilty or, no, or not guilty. And in the present case, the last thing to say is that I shall not need to ask you to confer and to arrive at a unanimous decision. It will be quite enough if by show of hands you indicate whether you are for guilty or for not guilty. Those are the ground rules, Mr. Boyce. Now, where are you going to speak from, Mr. Boyce? Because the jury needs to hear you. Is it easier if you move to one? Yes, that's fine. Magistrate, citizens, hail Caesar. <laughs> I'm here today from the Department of Army Legal Services within the Imperial Guard. I am Centurion Boyce. With me is Centurion MacDonald. Uh, the Imperial Guard is an equal opportunities employer. <laughs> you appear before us so that we might inform you of the true facts of the wicked and cowardly murder of the divine Julius Caesar by the wicked and cowardly Brutus and Cassius, 
the guilty defendants, and 58 others. We come to bury Brutus and Cassius, <laughs> not to praise them. In the legal services department of the Imperial Guard, we regard ourselves as being at the forefront of innovation in technology and procedure. We have warmly embraced BCM, better case management, DCS, digital case systems, and EPE, electronic presentation of evidence. However, we are currently being held back from implementation because we don't yet have electricity. <laughs> We shall, though, uh, still assist you with visual aids and allow me to introduce to you the victim in this case, the divine Julius Caesar. <laughs> As to the trial process, we understand that in the northern continental wastelands, far beyond Germania, there is a region called Kafka, where their trial system appears to be an abomination. In a Kafka trial, the judges are not provided with any evidence before they reach their guilty verdicts on the basis that they may be prejudiced thereby. The Imperial Guard would not countenance trial without evidence. It would be a clear breach of Roman human rights law and would result in interminable appeals by intellectuals <laughs> to the Roman Court of Human Rights, if there was one. <laughs> uh, we in the Imperial Guard much prefer our own method. Uh, we make sure that the defendants are dead before the trial begins. <laughs> it makes for a much more efficient system, and thus you may be assured that Brutus and Cassius are already dead ducks. <laughs> uh, they are represented, however, you may have thought, we in the Guard certainly did, that they would wish to be represented by Cicero, who once enjoyed a reputation. He was, as you know, from his discovered private writings, a weasel. After the murder of divine Caesar, pretending support for the people and their rights, but reveling in the slaughter by his friends and accomplices of those citizens who sought to enforce the rights granted to them by divine Caesar. He should have been an accomplice in the murder, but even the 60 senatorial killers excluded him from their number because they feared that he would be too timid to strike a dagger blow, and because they knew that he would make impossible contractual demands for his participation, and he would refuse to go to arbitration if there was a falling out. And who can afford civil court fees these days? <laughs> he was, though, the worst of them all. His brain thought dishonest poison, his tongue spoke dishonest poison, and his hands wrote dishonest poison. You'll be pleased to learn, therefore, that the Imperial Guard has already secured the removal of his brain, tongue, and hands, and he's no longer feeling himself. <laughs> Just think about that one. <laughs> We understand that Assassins International, a now defunct charity for want of any living members, sent a representative to the temple to seek guidance regarding representation. Whilst there, the representative, it is said, tripped over a black stone. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are. The choice has now been made between Cicero without a brain, tongue, or hands, on the one hand, sorry, and Mr. Pito and uh, Ms. Lester on the other. They're both QCs, which I think stands for quality controlled. <laughs> but you'll have to judge how controlled their quality is and has been. I'm also a QC, uh, but in my case, it stands for quintessentially centurion. Uh, centurion McDonald isn't. We should add this. Uh, we are here as unbiased, impartial prosecutors and as ministers of justice. We come before you as simple soldiers. Soldiers who loved and served with Caesar, 
continue to love the memory of Caesar and would always defend his memory and legacy. And we're not being paid to be here. <laughs> we are, like the band U2, working pro bono. <laughs> You should also remember that we're here reviewing the life and death of a real man, a man who lived and breathed, a man who wrote brilliantly. Forget Bernard Cornwell and Sharp, forget C.S. Forrester and Hornblower, read Caesar's Gallic Wars. A man who was fearless and a brilliant general, read of his campaigns for the good of Rome, for the good of you. A man of the people who showered them with land, with bread and with money, taken from the selfish oligarchs, including Brutus and Cassius, who were desperate to cling on to their power and wealth at the expense of the citizens of Rome, and whose interests they pretended to represent in the Senate. Who can forget? mighty Caesar's triumphal entrance into Rome following his defeat of the Gauls during the Gallic Wars. How he remained a man of the people, how he addressed hundreds of thousands of citizens, with many of those whom he had previously pardoned, including Brutus and Cassius beside him. How he told you of all of his victories in Gaul, in your name, and how he had killed 50,000 Gauls Gauls during the campaign. Do you remember the weasel Cassius shouting out, no you didn't, you only call, killed 25,000 Gauls, and how divine Caesar turned to him, and then to you. And then more in pity than in contempt, said what you all thought. Yes, I did. Everyone knows that in Europe, away Gauls count as double. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. I'm going to have to pause here. That was a Roman football joke. It may be that you Britons don't know much about European football. Or I suppose your team doesn't score many away Gauls. Does your team even have a manager, I ask myself. I move on. For the man, there was a woman. And there was a woman. And there was a woman. <laughs> well, actually, there were quite a few women. He was as courageous for the women he loved as he was for the Rome he loved. He refused to divorce his first wife, Cornelia, even though the dictator, Sulla, threatened to execute him if he did not. When Cornelia died, the then powerful Pompey offered him a relative, Pompeia, in marriage, and he stayed married to her until a member of her family brought disgrace by misbehaving at a religious ceremony at which she was present, the Bona Dea scandal. And as he said, and as you knew, Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. But then Calpurnia who was and always remained above suspicion. Do you doubt her judgment of Caesar, a formidable woman who did all that she could to preserve his life from the assassins and thereby preserve their marriage and preserve Rome's future? Caesar's nobility, compassion for Romans and Rome and foresight knew no bounds. Clearly identifying Brutus as a troubled youth Caesar generously slept with Brutus's mother, Servilia, for years to comfort the poor woman. Recognising Cleopatra as a major player in Egyptian politics at a time when Egyptian wheat was essential in the feeding of Rome, noble Caesar sacrificed himself in her bed relentlessly. <laughs> producing a son, Ptolemy, better known as Caesarian Little Caesar, in an attempt to secure Roman hegemony, over Egypt and its wheat. And was not Caesar a religious man? He was a priest at the Temple of Jupiter at the age of 18, a man of peace because a priest was not allowed even in the presence of a standing army, much less to fight or to go to war. Had not vengeful Sulla removed his priesthood because of his marriage to Cornelia, the daughter of an enemy of Sulla, 
would not Caesar still be sacrificing goats and examining their entrails? Charming. Even when he had been cast on the road to high office and to power, did he not seek and receive the office of Pontifex Maximus, or as you Britons might call him, Pope? As we peer into the future and look thousands of years ahead, what do we see? For reasons beyond our understanding, opinions over the assassination of divine Caesar start and remain divided. As for Brutus, by way of example, few historical fi figures have inspired such a conflicting legacy. In Dante's Inferno, Dante was, or rather Dante will be, an Italian. <laughs> Brutus and Cassius and Judas will be placed, one each, into the three mouths of Satan at the very centre of hell and eternally chewed by Satan himself for their crimes of betrayal. Swift, Gulliver's Travels. Brutus will be described as virtuous and benevolent, though you will need to recollect and bear well in mind that the country which apparently praised Brutus in Gulliver's Travels was called Glub Drub Drib. <laughs> Do I need to say more? And it should be remembered that Jonathan Swift himself was born, uh, will be born, educated and die in Dublin a city which will never benefit from Roman civilization <laughs> or authority. The interpretation of Brutus as either an opportunistic traitor, correct, or as a selfless fighter against dictatorship, not correct, will shift with the tides of history and politics. But even in 2,000 years' time, questions about the price of liberty the conflict between personal loyalties and universal ideals and the unintended consequences uh, will remain more relevant than ever. Two final thoughts before Centurion MacDonald indulges you with her learning. Firstly, it can never be tyrannicide when one tyrant kills another, not that Caesar was ever a tyrant. And that is the case even when the murderous tyrant who kills is an oligarchy of 60. The Roman people at the time saw right through Brutus and Cassius and their murderous gang, and the murderers had to flee Rome, never to return. Noble Caesar's historic experiment of forgiving his enemies, as he had done in the case of Brutus and Cassius and countless others, treating Brutus like a son, was not repeated by his successor, Octavian Augustus Caesar. Proscription and execution returned as the norm. And lastly, think on this. When you come to judge the man, Julius Caesar, because in judging him, you will judge them, do look into the future. In 2,000 years' time, with electricity, with air travel, with cuts in legal aid, all the attributes of a developed civilization. <laughs> if you go to the Roman Forum on the Ides of March in 2,000 years' time, to the very site where Caesar's mortal remains were cremated, you will see that it is covered in flowers, fresh flowers, every year, in homage from the people to their Caesar. I hope when this is over, you'll go to the bar and you'll order yourself a drink and toast the great, the immortal Caesar. Order an Italian drink, a Martinus. <laughs> and being classic classicists, if you want a double, you'll know what to order. Hail Caesar. Thank you, Mr. Boyce. Mr. MacDonald. Learned friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. As you've been told, we are here to prosecute Brutus and his co-conspirator Cassius. They, together with a number of others, brutally murdered Julius Caesar on the Ides of March 44 BC. Their counsel, no doubt, will tell you that this was an act of tyrannicide, 
that they should be hailed as liberators and acquitted. We do not seek to persuade you that tyrannicide is never justifiable or justified. That subject cannot adequately be covered in the 10 minutes remaining. And more importantly, it's not necessary because this was not an act of tyrannicide. It was a brutal, calculated, and cold-blooded murder. And how can you be sure that it wasn't tyrannicide? Well, three things can make you sure. One, it was not necessary. Two, what happened in the aftermath. And three, the conspirators had other motives. The claim of tyrannicide is a smokescreen to hide their true criminality. So first of all, necessity. Caesar was not a tyrant. He may well have seized power unconstitutionally when he crossed the Rubicon River in 49 BC. But once in power, he was a man of the people. He was a man of justice who granted clemency to many who had betrayed him. He was a man of honor. The people loved him. Caesar was a man who tirelessly and fearlessly conquered country after country for the glory and prosperity of Rome, risking life and limb for us. On his return, he made real attempts to deal with some of Rome's long-standing problems by supplying the city with enough food, providing subsidies, and initiating a campaign to provide for war veterans. He built roads, installed harbors and drainage schemes to give the city, citizens of this city the quality of life that they deserve. Even after his death, Caesar continued to give to his people. As in his will, he gave 75 drachmas to each Roman man and left his gardens across the river to the people. Brutus has claimed, however, that Caesar was ambitious. And Brutus, we've been told, is an honorable man. But let us examine that claim. When Caesar was presented with a crown, he refused it not once, not twice, but three times. Brutus and Cassius might have feared that Caesar would one day overstep the mark, but they were just that, fears. Caesar had shown no desire to do so, quite the opposite. He had refused the crown. And what about the mechanics of his demise? Was murdering him really necessary? Could they not have spoken to Caesar, presented him with a list of grievances and attempted to negotiate? Could they not have imprisoned him, exiled him, removed his titles, perhaps even put him on trial? What did they have to fear from taking any one of these routes? The only logical answer is they feared that the people of Rome, the people that loved him so much, would flock to his aid and free him. If that be the answer, and what other answer could there be? Then, they were, then were they not merely attempting to replace one man's idea of governance, dictatorship, with their own? Intending to forcibly replace the dictator with another who would benefit the aristocracy that's Brutus and Cassius and their co-conspirators, instead of the masses. All you have to do is look at the way in which the murder took place to see that this was not an act born of necessity. Caesar, who had been reluctant to attend the Senate, following pleas from his wife that he should stay home, was lured out from the safety of that home under false pretenses by the very people who meant to do him harm. And they didn't give him a quick death, for example, by poisoning him, cutting his throat, beheading him. No, they killed him slowly. He was viciously and mercilessly stabbed time after time after time, as each one of the conspirators fought to get his own knife in. It was a bloodthirsty frenzy, during which some were so excited and out of control that they actually stabbed each other. Then, last of all, Brutus, the honorable Brutus, 
who claimed to be Caesar's friend, stuck his knife in last of all, so that Caesar would feel not only the cold, hard blade as it ripped through his defenseless body, but would also feel the agony of betrayal as he passed from this life into the next. Then, as Caesar's body lay dead at the foot of the statue of Pompey, stabbed no less than 23 times, our witness, William Shakespeare, reports that the bloodthirsty and excitable killers bathed in Caesar's blood, besmeared their swords, and ran out into the marketplace, raving their red weapons over their heads. So horrific was the scene that other members of the Senate fled for their lives and panic spread throughout the city. Does this sound like an act born of necessity to you? Second, the aftermath. You can be sure that this was murder, not tyrannicide, because of what happened afterwards. If this truly had been tyrannicide, and Brutus and Cassius had murdered Caesar for the good of the people, then they would have had some sort of plan something or someone to replace the man that they had come to so despise. But they didn't. Brutus merely gave two speeches before he and his co-conspirators were forced to retreat for safety. Far from being martyrs to the cause, more concerned with the good of Rome than the fate of any one man, they committed murder and then cowardly ran for the hills, only emerging when Mark Antony, who remained loyal to Caesar throughout, convened the Senate. What happened at the meeting on the 17th of March, you might find interesting. None of Caesar's acts were repealed, not a single one. If Caesar had been so oppressive, so tyrannical whilst alive that he had to be killed, why was nothing repealed following his death? The only thing the only thing they negotiated for was what they should obtain following their actions. Namely, assurances that they would face no punishment and allotments of provinces. Brutus was awarded Crete, Cassius got Africa, Trebonius received Asia, to name but a few. Can it really be said that these men were acting selflessly for the good of Rome and the good of her people? Then everything went rapidly downhill for Rome as she was plunged into war. Octavian, who had been named by Caesar as his heir, joined forces with Mark Antony and raised an army. Brutus and Cassius raised armies. Cicero was killed. And then Brutus and Cassius committed suicide after the battle at Philippi. There was a cold war. There were proxy wars fought by friends. Roman soldier on Roman soldier, the blood count was staggering. Then, in 31 BC, Octavian became the sole ruler as Augustus Caesar, and his rule was more monarchical and absolute than anything Caesar had ever attempted to impose. If Caesar had been an evil, and we say he wasn't, he certainly was the lesser of the two. Finally, the real motives of these conspirators. The reality is, this was a sinister and ill-thought-through plot, steeped in jealousy, resentment, and greed. Brutus and Cassius had reason to resent Caesar from the start. They had sided with Pompey against him in the civil war from 50 to 49 BC, and received clemency after the victory of Caesar no doubt at some personal cost. They resented the decline of their own power, resented the fact that the average Roman citizen was benefiting whilst they were losing out. They resented the love that the Roman people had for their dictator. Their motives were not pure, quite the opposite. And the actions of the gods prove this. The gods would not have sought to warn Caesar to save him by sending a soothsayer and giving visions to his wife if they had not thought 
that the co-conspirators' moves were not justifiable. The gods would not have been so enraged following the death of Caesar had this been anything other than a murder, and their rage was clear. They caused Etna to erupt with ferocious flames and rocks. They sent apparitions to Brutus. They caused strange hounds to bay across the sea in dry land, and a comet was seen in the sky for seven days. All of this was reported by our witnesses, Virgil, Plutarch, and Shakespeare. And if you want any further proof that this was driven only by greed and resentment, examine their actions after this murder. Within two days, they had amassed vast amounts of land and armies, which they paid for through illegitimate means, or, in the case of Brutus, borrowed money that had been obtained through illegitimate means, so he didn't have to dirty his own vulnerable hands. These were not whiter-than-white individuals, not as honourable or moral as they would have you believe. The murder was gratuitously brutal, and afterwards they sought only to regain power and line their own pockets and the pockets of people like them. This was not an execution for the greater good. Far from it. It is simple. These men are guilty of a heinous crime. The murder of a man that you once loved, and not without cause. A man for whom the city of Rome now mourns. Thank you very much, Mr. Donald. <clears throat> and that's the case for the prosecution, I take it. It is. Thank you, Magistrate. Thank you. Mr. Peter. <clears throat> May it please your Lordship and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I have the honour of representing Brutus and his associates, along with my learned friend, Maya Lester QC. Now, sure, these defendants are honourable men, and they acted as they did because there was, sure, no honourable alternative. His own leading counsel, a noble centurion of the guard, has repeatedly described him as divine Caesar again and again. He was venerated, therefore, as divine by his own troops, by his own men of action, by his own tough veterans. His junior counsel has called upon Caesar's apparent fellow gods as witnesses for his nobility, his divinity, and his invulnerability. Therein lies the very evil which my clients faced. And this is how it came to pass. We go back to the 10th of January, BC 49. General Julius Caesar stood on the north bank of the river Rubicon at the head of the 13th Legion, the Germana. Tough, veterans, and unquestioningly his loyal supporters. Caesar was the most powerful military man in the Western world. He's conquered Gaul and he subdued the Germans, but he is not just a soldier. He's one of the subtlest thinkers of his time. He's a published historian and he's a well-known linguistic philosopher. There's no doubt that he understood precisely the meaning of what he was about to do. He was going to cross the River Rubicon and take his army into Rome. Now, to the south of the River Rubicon stood the Roman Republic. It stood there for five solid centuries the Republic's a bastion of constitutional justice and law, legal rights, and individual liberty. And above all, it stands for the control of personal power. They don't have one consul, a rough equivalent to a prime minister today. They always have two, so they can keep an eye on each other. They're only elected for one year, so they can't become too powerful, and they can't stand again for 10 years just in case they get any ideas. The Senate, which is the nearest equivalent to our Parliament, is elected from the upper classes, the patricians, as they were called. This isn't the full democracy as we understand it now, but it ensures that power and influence are spread amongst the many. This is similar to English democracy as, as it existed before 1832, before the Great Reform Act, when only property owners could vote. But the Republican Senate looks after the people and the public interest. Their proud motto is SPQR. Senatus Populusque Romanus, 
the Senate and the people of Rome. So the Republican Constitution is a guarantee against dictatorship and tyranny. The Republic hates kings and it hates tyrants. It still celebrates the overthrow of the last king of Rome over 500 years earlier, Tarquinius Superbus, or King Tarquin the Arrogant. Tarquinius was overthrown by an ancestor of my client, Brutus. The ancestor was also called Brutus. Now Caesar knows as he stands on the Rubicon by long tradition that generals are forbidden by the law of the Republic to take their armies across the Rubicon. It is high treason to do that. And on this occasion, for good measure, the Senate have ordered him not to do it. It's a good law. It's to preserve civilian rule and protect the Republic from a military takeover. The Americans bore this in mind when they drafted their constitution in the 18th century. They made the civilian president the commander-in-chief of their armed forces to prevent just that. But Caesar deliberately chooses to break this good law, to disobey the Senate, and to commit high treason. He knew he was doing wrong. As he crossed the river, he famously said, Alea yacta est, the die is cast. Playing with dice was one of the Roman soldiers' favorite occupations. It was their favorite form of gambling. Caesar knew he was doing wrong, and he knew he was taking a gamble. Once in Rome, though, it didn't take Caesar long to seize power. By February the next month, most of the Senate and his main rival, Pompeius, had fled the city. Within 18 months, Pompey's forces are routed, and Pompey himself is killed. So within a couple of years, Caesar is the unchallengeable military force in the Roman world. In October 49 BC, he gets what remains of the Senate, bribed and packed by him, to appoint him dictator of Rome. And a year later, in December 48 BC, he gets himself appointed dictator in the same way for another year. This is completely unconstitutional. It's never happened before like this. Dictators have virtual absolute power. By long-standing tradition, they're only appointed in times of grave national emergency and then only for six months. With one exception, Rome has seen no dictators for some 200 years, not since the Punic Wars, when Hannibal's terrifying elephants of war threatened the Republic's very existence. They were effectively the panzer divisions of the ancient world. The one exception was Sulla, who was appointed dictator 40 years earlier. But he quite properly gave up the dictatorship when the emergency was over. But Caesar ignores all that. He ignores the constitutional niceties. And in February 46, he gets his bribed and his cowed Senate to appoint him dictator, this time for 10 years. And then in February, BC 44 comes the last straw. Caesar bribes and threatens the Senate into appointing him dictator perpetua, or dictator for life. This is similar to Hitler's enabling act of 1933, when Hitler got the Reichstag to delegate its powers to him and giving him complete authority to make or unmake laws without consultation. So in Rome now, no one's life, no one's liberty, and no one's property or rights are safe. Caesar can take them away whenever he feels like it. Now the prosecution claimed that he was popular with the people, but then what dictator worth his salt is not a populist, and able to call upon a mob when he needs one? There's nothing anyone can do to oppose him or protest. He controls the armies. There's no courts to appeal to, no police to report him to, no international organization or United Nations to go to, no outside allies to invade or liberate. His dictatorship means effective slavery for all. But there was not just a last straw, there was also a last nail. On the Ides of March, 15th of March 44 BC, Caesar is going to coerce and bribe his packed Senate into putting the last nail into the coffin of the Republic. He's going to get them to appoint him king of Rome. He says that's necessary for him to go and fight the Parthians, a nation in what is now Iraq. He says he will need to take the title of king with him in order to give him authority. But a king means a monarchy, and that means the destruction of the Republic and its institutions. New oaths, new rituals, and absolute power and glory for Julius Caesar. 
When Councillor Macdonald says that three times he refused the crown at the hands of Mark Antony, as her witness Shakespeare reminds us, this is rank hypocrisy. This was precisely what he was going to get the Senate to do. And this is not all. Caesar's giving unmistakable signs of becoming power mad. He declares himself a god, as we are reminded by his council or by the prosecution council. He claims descent from Venus. He puts his statue up with those of the other gods in Rome. He puts his heads on the coinage. It's the first time a living Roman has had his head put on a coin that's normally reserved for the gods. He puts himself above the religious authorities. When he was given a bad omen, he says contemptuously, I can get a better omen whenever I wish it. Someone puts diadems on his statue, signs of kingship. Two tribunes of Rome rightfully and properly had them removed. According to the prosecution witness Shakespeare, Caesar silenced them. He showed contempt for the authority of the Senate by getting a golden throne and by failing to stand when they entered. He sneered at the Republic, saying it was a mere nothing, a shadow, just a word without body or form. And finally, he said that Sulla, the former dictator, didn't even know the ABC of politics because he was so foolish as to give up a dictatorship when it was in his grasp. So in that situation, what was an honest Roman to do? If nothing was done on the Ides of March, every Roman would be no better than Caesar's slave. Brutus and his friends knew this. They sincerely believed that from the bottom of their hearts. Harsh words have been said about my client Brutus. He was motivated, though, solely by public spirit. The prosecution say that he killed out of self-interest. This is not true. The prosecution say rightly that Caesar had treated Brutus as a son. It's true, he'd be given top two jobs by Caesar. He'd been appointed a provincial governor, appointed a praetor, and he'd been promised a consulship in two years' time. So killing Caesar was very much against Brutus's self-interest. He stood to be the top collaborator in this dictatorship, should he have chosen to stay there. Cicero, who despite what my learned friends say was an incorruptible statesman, had the highest regard for Brutus. Brutus was no fool. He was also a published philosopher, a member of the school of Plato, which hated tyranny. Ladies and gentlemen, you can trust that my client Brutus would have formed a philosophical judgment after hard thought on the merits of what the right thing to do was. We know this from the way he questioned candidates for the conspiracy, asking them whether they thought that civil war was better or worse than tyranny. He had no court to go to for a declaration. He had to rely upon his own judgment, doing the best he could. He would have felt the full weight and burden of his illustrious ancestors on his shoulder. So the Ides of March <clears throat> was the very last chance to save Rome from tyranny. Killing Caesar was the only option. They had no means of restraining him, imprisoning him or exiling him. He had all the soldiers on his side. So what was an honest and honorable Roman to do? If they did nothing, they would also become traitors to the Republic and collaborators with the dictator Caesar. Council MacDonald says there was no necessity. They didn't need to kill him. There was no other option. Imprisonment, restraint, these were not possible. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the famous member of the anti-Nazi resistance, said that not to act is to act, and not to speak is to speak. Brutus and his friends had a stark choice. Act to save the Republic and freedom, or do nothing and become traitors to the Republic and collaborators. No one can doubt this was their sincere belief. Ladies and gentlemen, condemn Brutus and his friends in the eyes of history, and we condemn ourselves and our children to helplessness before tyranny forevermore. But acquit them and set them free, and we set ourselves free and our children free from future tyrannies and their harsh commands in states unborn and accents yet unknown. So for the sake of poor and oppressed peoples everywhere and for all time, I ask you to set them free. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Peter. Ms. Lester. Mm. 
My Lord, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, let me fast forward 1,831 years from 44 BC to 1787 to Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Benjamin Franklin pressed the state delegates for words to be included in the draft US Constitution on what should be done with presidents who are guilty of treason. Why? Because, he explained, what was the practice before this, he said, in cases where the chief magistrate rendered himself obnoxious? Why, recourse was had to assassination. It was better, he said, to provide in the Constitution for the regular punishment of the executive. It was George Mason that proposed the formulation they eventually adopted. The president could be impeached for treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Historians are in little doubt about the example Benjamin Franklin had in mind when he talked of the chief magistrate rendering himself obnoxious. He had read Plutarch and Shakespeare, and Rome loomed large in the minds of the founding fathers. The Roman Republic was a symbol of their hopes for the future. Julius Caesar was his obnoxious chief magistrate. And Benjamin Franklin was right. Before our modern constitutions, with their checks and balances, and their entrenched means of checking abuse of power, recourse had to be had to killing rulers who abused their power. The accused before you today come in a long tradition of people who have risked their lives, who have been prepared to die for their ideals, for ridding their countries of illegitimate rulers who subvert the constitution. My clients and their ancestors and their contemporaries drew clear distinctions between legitimate rulers and tyrants, and between criminal assassination, which we call murder, and tyrannicide. Now, I asked one of the conveners of this trial a few days ago, by what laws these accused will be judged today? Are we assuming, I asked, the law as it stands today, or at the time of Caesar's death? A very good question, came back the reply, but for our purposes, a little over-technical. <laughs> so there we have it. The accused come today not knowing the case against them before Mr. Boyce opened his mouth, brought to trial in a foreign land over 2,000 years after the events in question. And in a sense, I was being over-technical because, ladies and gentlemen, whether you judge the defendants in their proper context, as we say you should, in law, context is everything, by the standards of their time, or whether you judge them by the criminal law of England in 2016, the answer is clear, and we shall come on to that. Because although the context is different, the problem is the same. How to deal justly with unchecked executive power gathered and abused in a single person. You have heard the evidence summarized by Mr. Peto. Caesar was a tyrant on any definition. You have heard how he seized absolute and perpetual power of his shameless acts of treason, how despotic domination by one man was a betrayal of Roman ideals. You have heard that on the Ides of March, he was about to gain the feared title that would have subverted the very basis of the res publica forever, a fact ignored by the prosecution. The Greek and Roman world had never doubted the rightness and justice of tyrannicide. The men who risked their lives to rid the country of a tyrant were heroes and not murderers. Plato and Aristotle condemned those who governed for themselves and not for the general welfare. Harmodius and Aristogiton personified Athenian democracy for having killed Hipparchus and liberated Athens from tyranny. In the words of a contemporary Attic drinking song, they have killed the tyrant and made Athens a land of equal rights. Their descendants were awarded privileges. And there were bronze statutes of them in 6th and 5th century Athens. There were bronze statutes in Rome of Junius Brutus, the first defendant's ancestor, who had banished the tyrant Tarquin 500 years earlier. And Plutarch describes Roman citizens writing the first defendant notes, encouraging him to take up his ancestor's mantle. Cassius told Brutus that Romans expected from him as a hereditary debt, the extirpation of tyranny. And years after the events in question today, 
Statues to these defendants, Brutus and Cassius, were erected alongside the Greek tyrannicides, says Dio Cassius, to commemorate no less a glorious deed on the Ides of March. Cicero, the finest lawyer of the day, much maligned by Mr. Boyce, who plainly did not enjoy his Latin homework at school, <laughs> wrote letters and books explaining why the defendants were justified in killing Caesar. This was, he said, the finest of all glorious deeds. We are not born for ourselves alone, he explained, but for the city, for the country, and for our lineage. And Suetonius, Caesar's biographer, was clear that Caesar abused his power and was justly slain. Plutarch, the prosecution witness, called this indeed a tyranny avowed, since Caesar's power was not only absolute, but perpetual too. This view of tyrannicides as just heroes has been shared across the ages. Shakespeare's Cassius asks, in how many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over in states unborn and accents yet unknown? The answer is a lot of ages and a lot of accents. And although the accents were different, the verdict has been the same. John of Salisbury in the 12th century, Thomas Aquinas in the 13th, the French resistance theorists and Calvinist theorists of the 16th century, Beza Buchanan, John Knox, Thomas More, all united in regarding the defendants as being just defenders of the people from tyranny. And on and on, John Milton in the 17th century said, a tyrant is the common enemy and the people may lawfully proceed against him as against a common pest and destroyer of mankind. The jurisprudence of the 17th and 18th century were also in no doubt that Caesar's killing was legally justified, Grotius, Vatel and Gentili. And John Stuart Mill in the 19th century, a great thinker on the problems of abuse of power, regarded tyrannicide as an act of exalted virtue for killing a criminal who, by raising himself above the law, placed himself beyond the reach of legal punishment or control. Is the position so different today, ladies and gentlemen, of the jury? If the accused are, most unfairly, we would suggest, to be judged today on the basis of English domestic criminal law, 2060 years after the fact. We say it is not. We may not use the language of tyrannicide, but we come down on the same side of the line. If it were not being too technical, my clients would have pleaded self-defense. The first requirement of this plea is that the defendants honestly, even if mistakenly, believed it was necessary to use force in defense of themselves or another, including to prevent crime. This is obviously so. In the absence of trial transcripts, we have Shakespeare, the prosecution's witness. He is clear that they acted in order to defend themselves and their people and to prevent far worse to come. Brutus says, I know no personal cause to spurn at him, but for the general, he would be crowned. The alternative was to let, as he put it, high-sighted tyranny range on till each man drop by lottery. Cassius recounted, how Caesar doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonourable graves, age thou art shamed. They were single-minded in their attempt to prevent further crime and worse, the destruction of the state and the enslavement of its people. And Cassius, via Shakespeare, says, they say the senators tomorrow mean to establish Caesar as king. This is the origin of the phrase, a serpent's egg which hatched, would as his kind grow mischievous and kill him in the shell. So if you think my clients did or may honestly have believed it was necessary for them to defend themselves or others, the second limb is whether the force used was reasonable in the circumstances. And the burden is on the prosecution to prove so that you, the jury, are sure that the accused were not acting in lawful self-defense. They have not even attempted to do so. You have heard from Mr. Peto, and it hardly needs saying, that the reality is there was no option short of death. In modern times, we try to deal with abuse of state power with enforceable human rights treaties, with war crimes tribunals, international law on humanitarian intervention, on enemy combatants, and on targeted killings. But these were not available to the accused. Recall Benjamin Franklin's observations about the practice before in cases where the chief magistrate had rendered himself obnoxious. 
As my client put it, again, via Shakespeare, had you rather Shakespeare, were, had you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves than that Caesar were dead to live all free men? Ladies and gentlemen, in 1983, Balliol College, Oxford, held a series of memorial lectures in honour of a former member and Rhodes Scholar, Adam von Trott zu Zoltz. The award given to him was not for academic achievement, but for his part in the unsuccessful plot to take the life of Hitler in July 1944, which led to his execution a month later. When my Lord, Lord Hughes, asks you to cast your vote today, as good Roman jurors, you know that you will mark your wax tablets with a C, condemno, or A, absolvo. You will place them in a jar, and they will be counted. It is no more conceivable, ladies and gentlemen, that you could condemn my clients, men prepared to lay down their lives for the freedom of all of us, than that you would have condemned Mr. Zuzolt and the Hitler bomb plotters or for that matter, Helen Titchener in The Archers. <laughs> we ask you to absolve them once and for all time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lester. Well, members of the jury, you've heard all the case. <clears throat> you will, I know, have admired the demonstrations from leading counsel uh, of the traditional principle methodologies of criminal advocacy. On the one hand, ruthless eschewing of the evidence <laughs> in favor of denunciation and repeated assertion of guilt. On the other, the equally vigorous um, determination to give all the evidence himself. <laughs> in the end, was it murder? Murder for political ends, murder by political rivals, or was it justified last resort uh, tyrannicide? Along the way, you will want to ask yourselves, I expect, uh, a number of questions, and these are only some of them. Did he call himself a dictator? because he was taking control of a decaying system as a benevolent governor in the interests of the people? Or did he call himself dictator and divine because he craved personal power? Was he a populist because he mobilized the mob? Or was he a populist because he ruled in the interests of the people. Was the Republic a model uh, uh, against which uh, there was, uh, which needed preservation and against which any alternative system was treason? Or had it become a cover for a self-perpetuating oligarchy? Is the absence of a plan amongst political plotters uh, to be, ex to be a, a, a plan for what is to be carried out in the event of victory in whatever political process, tyrannic uh, assassination, referendum, or whichever? <laughs> uh, is the absence of a plan a reliable indication uh, that the uh, underlying uh, campaign is bad, or may it happen even though there is a legitimate grievance? In the end, was it self-aggrandisement or simple political infighting? Was it Bonhoeffer and von Stauffenberg, or Idi Amin and Saddam Hussein? The accused will stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to take the verdict or am I? Would those who say guilty condemn no, please raise their hands. Count them, please, over here.
Keep them up. <laughs> About 18, 19. Yeah. And those who say absolvo, I think the no's have it. <laughs> Very well. God will be waiting outside. <laughs> Let them be discharged to await the verdict of history. <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen.